My name is Dr. Laura Williams, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Global Strategic Services and Patient Advocacy at Ardelix. We are a biopharma company committed to discovering, developing, and commercializing unique and innovative first-in-class therapies to meet unmet medical needs. We're here today to discuss the challenges and opportunities for people living with chronic kidney disease who are on dialysis. Dialysis is a treatment that filters the blood to remove unwanted toxins, waste products, and excess fluids for people whose kidneys are no longer working properly. For people with kidney failure, renal replacement therapy in the form of either regular long-term dialysis or kidney transplant is necessary to stay alive. Nearly 560,000 Americans are on dialysis. Black Americans are almost four times more likely than white Americans to develop kidney failure. And Hispanic Americans are also at a higher risk. The five-year survival rate for patients on dialysis is under 50%. And 55% of deaths among patients on dialysis are due to cardiovascular disease. Chronic kidney disease or CKD is a complex and multifaceted disease with a number of comorbidities that add to the intricacies of managing these patients. People with CKD who are on dialysis, for example, are often managing multiple chronic conditions such as diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, elevated cholesterol, as well as conditions associated with kidney failure itself, such as hyperphosphatemia or elevated phosphorus levels and anemia or low hemoglobin levels. I'm honored to be joined by two people who are living this reality every day, one as a patient and another as an academic-based healthcare provider. Ms. Dawn Edwards is a wellness ambassador, a patient advocate, and CKD champion who has lived with kidney disease for almost 30 years. And Dr. Cam kalantar today is chief of the Division of Nephrology and Hypertension at University of California, Irvine and a practicing nephrologist who's been treating patients for over 20 years. Dawn? Thank you for inviting me here today to share my story and what inspires me to advocate for people living with kidney disease. So I was diagnosed with kidney disease at the age of 23. I actually thought that I was pregnant with my second child. I was excited to go to my doctor's appointment and excited to hear the news. Instead, I was told by uh, my physician that my kidneys were failing and that I needed to see a nephrologist immediately. And my life has never been the same since. Dialysis itself, it requires a significant amount of time and patience and a real reassembly of my family unit. And I'm fortunate that I have a lot of family members to help me and to support me. Not only do I have to manage dialysis, but I also have a number of other complications for my kidney disease, having lived on dialysis for almost 30 years. Um, I had a failed transplant and I resumed back to dialysis. Um, I also have bone disease and I also had a bout of colon cancer, leaving me with a permanent ostomy. So living with kidney disease has been a series of challenges. Understanding kidney health means you have to understand bone health, heart health. You have to understand what to eat and you also have to monitor how much fluid that you, you drink in the course of a day. One of the things that I found to be most challenging about kidney disease is, my, is managing my phosphorus. The diet restrictions are really, um, they're really hard. 
Um, in my family, food means love. And it may not be the healthier foods, but it's always full of love. And watching my phosphorus as carefully as I need to, to maintain my health, I often can't participate in that love that comes from the kitchen um, with my family because I need to follow those dietary restrictions and try to avoid these um, foods with phosphorus. I've learned that you have to read the labels to look for hidden phosphorus. So I'm constantly looking at foods before I buy them, cook them or consume them. I can definitely assure you, I didn't know what phosphorus was or what made it hidden, but I quickly had to learn that phosphorus is used as a preservative in many foods. And dialysis often doesn't do a great job at taking the phosphorus out like healthy kidneys would. And so for patients on dialysis, we just have to really be careful at how much phosphorus we take in. And it's a vicious cycle. The foods with the most phosphorus are the ones that are most processed. And I'm a Brooklyn girl. I love pizza and I love beer. And both of them are considered to be high phosphorus foods. And many of the communities that patients, you know, that dialyze are urban lower socioeconomic communities, where it's especially hard to find healthy foods, um, to find clean foods. And often if you live in a food desert like myself, um, it's hard to afford these unprocessed natural clean foods. So it's definitely an uphill battle. Um, the foods that we do um, have in our neighborhoods are often processed, preserved, and um, they're expensive and it requires preparation. So if you're on dialysis, that can be uh, incredibly challenging as well to prepare meals and also um, maintain your dialysis appointments. In addition to trying to maintain this low phosphorus diet, we have to take medications for so many things. One of the medications is to lower our phosphorus levels. These medications that are available to lower, to lower phosphorus are called phosphate binders. They are huge pills that are incredibly difficult to swallow. Um, we have to take them with every meal, um, every time we eat, including snacks. Um, some patients take three up to six pills uh, with meals. And we're only allowed to drink 32 ounces of fluid a day. So imagine trying to swallow six large pills and keeping in mind that you have to balance that daily fluid allowance. So if you drink all of your fluid allowance trying to swallow pills, you can barely have um, something to drink with your meals. Since we need to take that medication every time we eat, we also always have to have it with us. These pills are large. They don't necessarily fit nicely into my purse. Um, it's embarrassing and stressful if we go out to a restaurant or if you have some type of spontaneous activity and taking the pills during a meal in public, it just makes you feel out of place and anxious you know, worrying about if you're going to be able to swallow all of these pills at the table or, you know, if you're going to end up gagging in front of everyone. And more, moreover, we have to take the, these binders and sometimes they make us feel nauseous, bloated, and sometimes even constipated. And even though we take the binders and we follow all of our dialysis treatments, many patients still have elevated phosphorus levels. And the burden of the treatment is just so great until a lot of us patients just give up. So I just wanted to share this piece of my story because I think we get so focused on dialysis and transplants and technology and the big things that we forget about the rest of what living life with dialysis 
and kidney disease and managing all of the comorbidities and medications is like. Improving the experience of lowering phosphorus would have a huge impact on a patient's health and the ability to just manage day-to-day -day life. I know that I'm fortunate that I can afford less processed food. And I know now that I, I, I have a better understanding of the relationship of my health needs and how food relates to that. But I still look forward to the day that I can live my life without having to think about my disease every minute. I hope Washington will listen to patients and our doctors as we look for an environment that incentivizes and supports new treatments for people like me. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, Don. That's certainly hard to follow. I, I feel privileged and honored that I get a say in the order of this panel. So as a practicing physician, nephrologist and researcher, I agree with Dawn with what just, she just said. I've seen firsthand the multiple challenges associated with treating patients on dialysis, uh, people like Dawn. The consequence of trying to take one day off from treatment and the apathy people sometimes feel because they have been blamed for their disease, and then they have come to believe that they should be blamed. How do we make treatment more patient-centric for uh, all people, especially for people who have chronic kidney disease and are on dialysis, with the accompanying complications and comorbidities they have? How do we do this? So focusing on what Don just shared with us, the experience of the individual patient and the burden Don feels, uh, all patients feel every day as they manage their life. So in addition to our efforts to treat the underlying cause of uh, CKD, chronic kidney disease, like hypertension and diabetes, so that we can slow the progression of kidney disease. Once the kidneys have failed, once we have been actually successful allowing these patients to live long and happy, so eventually chronic kidney disease may reach that stage, the kidney failure stage or encephalitis. There is an enormous burden, not only replacing kidney function with their dialysis or kidney transplantation, but also on maintaining patients' quality of life. When kidneys fail, the full impact of kidney disease is gigantic in terms of the impact on patients' quality of life and also their life itself. Also, since kidney disease greatly increases the risk of cardiovascular disease and mortality. So kidney failure leads to a number of problems for these patients, including fluid overload, anemia, feeling tired, high serum uh, parathyroid hormone, high serum phosphorus levels, which is also called hyperphosphatemia, just to name a few. All of these things have important consequences. For instance, elevated serum phosphorus is a strong independent risk factor for cardiovascular morbidity and mortality and a, a strong risk factor for bone disease and vascular diseases. Patients struggle every day to control their phosphorus. And in fact, despite treatment with currently available therapies, almost 80% of patients on dialysis are unable to achieve and maintain serum phosphorus levels in the target range over a six month period, for instance. These data have, have been consistent. And as Don described, there is an enormous and and uh, the burden on these patients it's, it's massive. It's affecting almost all aspects of life. And this, despite or especially as a result of uh, currently available therapies, uh, such as pill burden, for, for instance, all of which are part of the same class of treatment, that means phosphorus binder class. I've done a lot of research on protein and diet 
And the other way that many try to control phosphorus is with low phosphorus diets, which is an important way, of course. But in addition to the processed foods that Don described that have phosphorus, added phosphorus, in addition to that, we also try to control this by restricting diet or foods that have natural phosphorus. There are many foods with organic phosphorus is part of that, but they also have protein like meats and beans. And restricting these foods while limiting phosphorus also restricts protein, which is associated with other negative consequences for our patients. So the situation is very complex and management is not easy. So the bottom line is that innovation and more treatment choices that work in different ways and that recognize the patient's perspective are desperately, urgently needed in phosphorus management and in many aspects of kidney disease. Thank you both. Uh, I, I'd love to open this up to more of a, a Q&A discussion, if you, if you guys don't mind. Uh, I'll kick it off with a few questions uh, for each of you, and then I'll come back and conclude with how we at Ardelix view health equity and social determinants of health. And I also share a little bit about our focus on these constructs as a, as a matter of corporate responsibility, independent of any specific products or other state admissions. And I'll also try to highlight what we're doing to ensure that patients have access to innovative therapies uh, when, when they're unable to afford them. So I, I'm going to start, I'll, I'll probably go back and forth with each of you, but I'll start with you, Don, as a patient uh, yourself, as well as a patient advocate. You, you highlighted you know, some of the challenges of your nearly 30-year journey with CKD, uh, and you have obviously the perspective of both the dialysis and a transplant patient. Um, just wondering, is there, is there anything else you'd like to share with us as it relates to your personal journey? with kidney disease? For example, you know, some of your biggest challenges or, or your proudest accomplishments, uh, things that you've, you've been able to overcome? Well, I would like to, you know, just begin by stating that um, I did not get kidney disease from hypertension or diabetes. So I'm fortunate that um, those were not one of my comorbidities. Uh, I got kidney disease from a uh, from scarlet fever when I was a, a young child, and uh, I would I would say one of my biggest challenges um, with dealing with kidney disease is um, just managing um, everything outside of kidney disease, um, like life and finance. Um, I, I've gone through um, a lot of changes and had to make a lot of sacrifices as a result of kidney disease. Uh, I, I had a job, you know, I was working um, full time at, at, at the postal service when I was diagnosed. And uh, after a few years of doing dialysis, I discovered that I was no longer able to work and I had to go on disability in my 20s. And I went from making a wonderful government salary to um, just a very small amount of money a month. Um, and that's what I had to raise my, you know, my young child off of. Um, I, my marriage fell apart as a result of, you know, of kidney disease because um, my, my then husband just didn't understand and I lost my sense of self you know, as a result of trying to deal with my disease. So I would say just trying to manage life outside of kidney disease was my biggest challenge. That's, that's, a, that's really important uh, note to share, uh, Dawn. And so thanks for sharing. And, you know, in addition to obviously what you've already mentioned in terms of the challenges with nutrition and diet and fluid restriction, um, the bigger challenge of just managing life uh, is, is a real one. Um, and you just touched on a little bit in terms of just, you know, the importance, I think, of a support system and, and it, you know, and how when that isn't there, um, how challenging that could be. I, I wondered if you just touch a little bit on, you know, what what family members 
um, can do to support their loved ones who are diagnosed with, with chronic kidney disease or you know, the, you know, they're on dialysis and, and, or having a transplant. You know, what sort of things have, have, been, have worked for you in terms of just the, the family support that you've been able to have? Well, family support is absolutely essential in order to, um, to help a person that you love with kidney disease because there are so many other things involved. I mean, I would just generally say, um, put your seatbelt on and get ready for the ride because um, a life with kidney disease is up one, uphill one day and downhill the next day. Um, it requires a lot of resilience, a lot of support, and a lot of sacrifice. Um, for example, my sister had to step in and take care of my young child because I was so frequently hospitalized. Um, my, I had to um, leave my apartment and move back home with my parents. So everybody had to move back into their old rooms and, and we all had to bunk together again. Um, as far as finance is concerned, um, it's, it's really expensive uh, paying co-pays for medications and um, trying to buy quality foods. So we cooked together, and we shared meals. So um, family and um, community support is absolutely necessary in order for you to be able to maintain and have a healthy quality life with kidney disease. That's great. That's great. So, you know, Don, you've shared a lot, you know, from the patient perspective. I've got just a few more questions now, more so from a patient advocacy perspective. I wanted to just, you know, touch a little bit on sort of policies and healthcare disparities. I, 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 the first question is, is, is related to just the equitable delivery of healthcare and, and, and your take on that. Do you see an issue with the equitable delivery of healthcare for CKD patients on dialysis? I absolutely see um, an issue in equity in healthcare, uh, especially in the dialysis and CKD population. Um, I'm thankful for the attention that kidney disease is starting to get and the patient-centered care that, um, that we are now beginning to focus on. I'm really excited about um, moving forward in improving the quality of care that's going to, that's given to CKD and kidney patients, but I think we have a really long way to go. I think that our standard of care is the most important. There is a huge difference in the care that a patient receives on one side of town in one community that is received in another community. And I would really like to be a part of, and I would like to see um, all patients receive the same care, no matter what facility they're in, no matter what community they're in, the same amount of education, care, and support. Good points. I mean, health equity obviously is, is extremely important. Are, are there changes that you think um, from a policymaker standpoint that, 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 that could happen that would improve healthcare in this space? Absolutely. I think that we're starting off on the right foot. We're going in the right direction. We're noticing that there is inequity, that there are issues that need to be um, looked at and we're looking at them. And I, I think that we can absolutely do better we are placing a lot of focus on innovation and new dialysis machines and new technology and um, innovations in transplant and um, artificial kidneys and all of that is, th those are wonderful. And we're really looking forward to those things. Um, but I think that our policymakers and those who are interested in making quality of life better for for patients with CKD also need to talk to us patients and ask us how we feel and include us in a seat at the table when approving or thinking about new innovations and in technology for us. And, and we are doing that. And I think that that needs to be on, on a broader scale. And although we're looking at a lot of big things, I think that a little bit more focus 
um, should be placed on some of the smaller things, some of the smaller aspects of um, kidney disease that we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis that could make our quality of life better. Things that can make us feel better on our day-to-day -day journeys in dialysis and transplantation while we wait for these larger technologies to come forward. Those are all great points, Dawn, and I really appreciate your perspective on it. Uh, one last question for you. you know, how can we, our Delics, um, improve our public-private partnerships um, so that we could actually improve healthcare delivery in, in the CKD dialysis space? Any ideas? Well, I think Ardelix is really doing a great job so far. So far. Um, you're forward facing. Um, you include patients in moving forward um, with the products that you are representing and creating. You're thinking about um, not, the, not so much the big picture, but in helping patients to make it in their day-to-day -day walks with, um, with kidney disease. And I think that just continuing to do what um, you're doing now and keeping patients at the forefront and keeping kidney disease at the forefront of your research and development and all of your thinking will really help to push forward uh, um, everything that you're trying to do and make things a lot better for patients um, nat nationwide and worldwide. Thanks, Don. I really appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to jump now to Dr. Kalantar and and just just talk to talk about this, you know, in a, in a little bit more detail from a nephrologist perspective, as well as uh, again from a patient advocacy expect, uh, perspective. And I think the first one, uh, just just from you know a healthcare provider perspective, I w wanted to just ask. Um, if you could share a little bit in terms of a few ways by which we can decrease the prevalence or, or maybe slow the progression of CKD in communities of color. Yeah, th thank you very much. Uh, each time I uh, listen to people uh, like Don, when they share their experience, the journey, it's so educational, so inspirational. And, uh, and I, I feel always privileged to be part of this. Uh, there are so many uh, stories, uh, also sometimes less successful, sometimes more so, but we continue here, our partnership, we are all together here and with all the challenges and uh, lack of equities uh, as Don alluded to, and they do exist. And we are here to team up to find their solution. We never, we should never give up. And and Don's story is just one of those to inspire all of us. That kidney failure is not the end; it's just the beginning of a new journey. And the fact that she has been with us for thirty years and she's here as a patient advocate, as an expert, as a leader, this is uh, why we are here. Thank you, Don. Yes, I I, I would. I would wholeheartedly agree. Um, just to get back a little bit more to the to the policy discussions, I, I just wanted to point out a couple of things. You know, in an earlier publication this past April, uh, CMS, the Center of Medicare and Medicaid Services, acknowledged a host of health inequities among CKD patients across the you know the continuum of disease, from prevention all the way to treatment to types of renal replacement therapy, dialysis, or transplant. Um, and to that end, CMS has now proposed actions that aim to try and close that health equity gap um, by providing Medicare patients uh, with CKD who are on dialysis with greater access to care um, through the end-stage renal disease perspective payment system uh, annual rulemaking process. So what it aims to modify is the ESRD treatment choices in a way that would actually allow for more equitable uh, access to, to different treatments like home dialysis and kidney transplant. And, and we obviously applaud and commend CMS for these efforts, but, but I'd like to ask you a few questions as, as it relates to, to these initiatives. And the first one is, do you think the changes to the ETC, the ESRD treatment choices around 
these health equities uh, will have a major impact. And, and, and what else would you like to see CMS or the federal government do around CKD dialysis, uh, again, in terms of, of these health equities? Uh, yes, this is an important question, of course. And uh, the fact is that inequities have been in existence. It's uh, wrong to say to, to, that they don't exist or to, to deny their existence. Um, uh, and I'm going to say that actually that structural racism has been part of uh, what we have been practicing. And to say that uh, we don't uh, have structural racism is something would be disconnected. And as an example, home dialysis in the past, let me give you an example. The uh, African-Americans uh, or Black Americans, they represent 13 to 14% of the US population. Yet uh, among the dialysis patients, they are overrepresented 35, 30 to 35%. And it's two to three times more likely for an African-American, for a Black American to be on dialysis. Yet home dialysis was less offered to African-Americans until recently. So it's a great development. We're very proud. So Dawn again is uh, here to tell us uh, her story against uh, some of these trends. And the ETC model and others are here. They're not going to resolve the problems overnight, but it's a very important step to that direction, right? So how we can team up again to go after some of these uh, problems with uh, uh, equities and uh, with diversity inclusion in medicine, especially in nephrology, especially in kidney care, kidney medicine, renal medicine. And I'm very happy and proud that uh, uh, these new developments have been happening and I'm hoping that we continue to expand on them. Thanks, thanks Dr. Kalantar. I, I was just, interested in your perspective, I asked Don this question and I'll ask you as well. You know, what could policymakers change to, to, again, continue to try and decrease these health disparities in this population? Well, uh, as we discussed, to make everything available for everybody, regardless of uh, uh, certain uh, biases, for example, looking at certain patients that, oh, he or she is not a good candidate for this or that therapy or for this or that discussion. When I talk with the patients uh, to say, to think that <clears throat> this patient doesn't understand this level of uh, 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 education about diet, about phosphorus burden. And I have to tell the patient that, hey, you take these pills and without explaining why, you take so many pills for phosphorus controlling, right? So I need to <clears throat> really be convinced as a provider <clears throat> that all patients have the right to understand and have the right to be explained why we are doing something. And when they ask, we should not say that this patient is challenging or a difficult patient. This is patient's right. They are already dealing with a very difficult uh, a, a life impacting disease, chronic kidney disease. They, they are receiving dialysis. And we need to understand this. And instead of uh, labeling patients with this or that, we should, instead of blaming patients for the problem, we should really get look at ourselves and, and see what we can do. So policymakers have, have started doing a better job now with uh, improving some of these perspectives and bringing them in the heart of the policies. That means to give, for example, incentives to centers that uh, uh, focus more on minority uh, uh, health, uh, on, on uh, minority health uh, and minority education, for example, and, and to in allow same number of patients uh, from among African-Americans to have access to home dialysis as non-African-Americans should be equal. Should not be, there should not be any disparities here. And policymakers have, I think, have started doing a greater job in recent years with some of the changes that have been happening. Thank you, Dr. Kalantar. I really appreciate your perspective on that. And also appreciate the fact that, you know, what, what you're, you're highlighting here is the physician as a patient advocate, making sure that, 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 that the patients understand 
you know, what it is that they're going to, why, they, why going through and why they're on what treatment they are and what would be best for them. And not just, you know, telling them what to do, but listening to the patient and trying to understand, you know, sort of what is best for them. So I really appreciate that. One final question for you, though, is it, it just in terms of innovation and whether that's treatment, devices, policies, or, or otherwise, um, in, in this CKD dialysis space, what, what grade would you assign our progress over the last decade, just in terms of the innovation piece? And, you know, are we doing enough, uh, too little? Um, you know, what, what are areas of excitement and hope uh, from your perspective? Well, uh, Dr. Williams, so uh, Laura, let me just be honest with you. And, and in that, we, uh, we, uh, I, uh, say I, tend to blame patients for problems. Uh, let me, a good example of phosphorus. When patient's phosphorus is high, we go during the other rounds and says, you uh, non-compliant patients, why didn't you listen to me again? Why did you eat too much protein, too much this or that? This is exactly where we need innovations. Instead of a decade-long practice of blaming patients and other things, well, let's just expand the armamentarium. I mean, we can't, it's been several decades that we have phosphorus binders, and I'm uh, not blaming phosphorus binders for not doing the job, but phosphorus binders, they have their own limits. I, I increase the number of pills from one to two to three to four per meals, and all these pills are being given to our patients and, and patients uh, on dialysis have enough problems and enough challenges. And on top of that, I go during my weekly rounds and, and monthly rounds and, and say with the dietitian and everybody else say that why your phosphorus is high. So then we need to ask what happened, where are the innovations? What are the new class of medications that could help these patients? Why, instead of blaming patients, instead of imposing more dietary restrictions to, to patients, instead of affecting their uh, quality of life, I need to see what we can do together with the, with the teaming up with the pharmaceutical companies, with the, with the industry to find uh, uh, innovative approaches different mechanisms yeah. to control phosphorus again. So uh, this is just one out of many different things to make treatment patient-centered, to, mm. make, to create precision medicine. So thank you. No, I really appreciate that. And I think what you highlight is, you know, a, 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 a practice that, that we um, have obviously employed across a number of different disease states. When you think about diabetes and you think about hypertension, um, HIV, all of those things, we, we actually use that approach, right? Where we use a, a number of different agents across different classes to, to try and manage the disease. And so in a lot of ways, I think what you just highlighted is, is not that dissimilar from, again, the approach that, that we use when we try to manage a patient's diabetes and lower the air, their A1C or manage their, their hypertension and lower their blood pressure. Is that, is that a fair analogy? Yeah, these are all good analogies. I think they, they all make sense. And, uh, and as I said, we need uh, more innovative approaches. We need to really <clears throat> uh, push the envelope being outside of the box to, to bring additional uh, mechanisms, strategies. Uh, uh, my example of phosphorus controlling, we need to find other ways for that, for dialysis devices. Uh, and these are all related to also examples that you mentioned for CKD, diabetes, hypertension, everything else. If innovation is allowed in other areas or encouraged, why not also in kidney care arenas? No, that's that's great. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna close in just a minute here, but before I do, I'd like to just open it up again, both to you and Don, to see if you guys had any closing thoughts or, or any other, um, you know, sort of comments that that you'd like to share. And I'll start with you, Don. I I just want to thank you for the opportunity. Um, that's been given to me to share today. 
And I just want to say thank you to, um, to our delegates and to our physicians and all of our lawmakers for, um, for all of the hard work that they are doing to try to make things better for kidney patients. And I really hope that you know, a day does come where we can all work together to resolve uh, some of these side effects and symptoms of kidney disease and issues that patients face so that um, we can all receive better care and we can all have better quality of lives. Thanks, Don. Dr. Kalantar? Yeah, I, I can only echo what uh, Don and Stubi alluded to, that uh, we work together to ensure that uh, the theme of the uh, 2021 uh, uh, World Kidney Day, uh, that means living well with kidney disease, that we achieve that goal, so that patients with kidney disease, they feel that they can live long and well with kidney disease. And that requires that we all team up, especially with patients being uh, leading these efforts. Well, I'd like to thank you both. This was a, a wonderful session. It was really wonderful getting your insights. Um, and as I close, I, I'd just like to say that at Arvelix and, and globally, we, we know uh, that health equity means ensuring that every person can achieve their best health. Um, we also know that, unfortunately, many social determinants of health, like racial and ethnic discrimination, lack of access to quality education, inadequate or lack of housing, uh, income and wealth gaps, as well as unsafe environments, all of those things can limit one's access to good health practices and health care. And so as a matter of corporate responsibility, and, and more importantly, as a matter of principle, we're committed to being a part of the solution and trying to mitigate these disparities uh, that contribute to health inequities. And this is independent of any specific product or other state admissions. We, we leverage our partnerships with organizations um, that advocate for those living with kidney disease. And we focus on helping to establish policies that promote health equity and equality. And we seek to develop innovative therapies that address unmet medical need for those living with kidney disease while assuring equitable access to these treatments. Um, we've developed a state-of-the-art patient assistance program to assure that patients have access to our innovative therapies uh, when they're available and when they're unable to afford them. And so for me, I'm really proud to be part of a company that's committed to paving a way for new possibilities for patients and caregivers uh, to imagine a future where, uh, as Don says, illness won't control our lives is, is, is something worth dreaming for. So I thank you guys and I thank uh, the sponsor for the opportunity to share these insights with you today.